been long in coming, but um, one would like to think this was the easy part. What is the management structure that's behind this now to ensure that what you've agreed to will get on the way and um, within the timelines? Well, the centre will take form very shortly when it goes through the legal processes of the respective campuses. You know, you sign an MOU to establish an institution. The institution then has to be codified within the structure of the universities. And this could happen in very, very short time. Certainly for us at UWA, this will happen in a month's time. And then, of course, we decide on a governance model. where We will collectively agree on the governance model to enable the functions of the institute to work and to select projects to identify ways in which to give priorities to objectives. So an effective board of governance. Do you have a template? Uh, might have got into other areas uh, before that you might set to this? Um, because you speak of governance, how wheelly it might become, how large it might become. Well, as you know, we have an institute with the University of SUNY, uh, the State University of New York. There is a SUNY UWA Institute for Leadership and Sustainable Development. It has a joint board and it has joint directors, and it works perfectly well, gets the work done. So I imagine that we would probably propose that we emulate a model like that, but we will talk it through. Yes. Doctor, um, the same question to you, in terms of that structure behind it, we are miles apart. Uh, how do, of course you tell me distance is dead because of technology, but how do you ensure that you keep this momentum going? I think there is commitment from the senior management in, in both universities to make this a success and to put some resources behind it. The key thing will be getting good people to lead it and then excellent people to serve on the boards advising them. But if we can get really strong academics from different disciplines working together, establishing that rapport, that, that relationship, mutually supportive relationship over the next year or two, then I think we'll be off to a really good start. The commitment of Glasgow, clearly, um, it has shown itself. Um, are we likely to see that burgeoning even more and um, affecting even the classes that you teach? We do already uh, touch on, on subjects like slavery and the slave trade in, in our history classes, but to some extent also in, in other disciplines as well. I think if we can excite interest across the disciplines, across the social sciences, the humanities, into the medical sciences, perhaps even into the engineering uh, faculty, then I think we will see some real interest and uh, the creative imagination of our academics to establish joint projects. Um, if my cameraman could back out a bit and show the two pictures here. Clearly, history has something to do, but here we are at a university level talking about uh, we're going to do something about it, the ethics of it. We're not going to study and run. Uh, give me a sense of your pride. Is, is, is it a proud moment for you to, to, to have this, this? The picture is telling me something. It's a very proud moment for me. And uh, I, I believe that um, University of Glasgow, as, as I said, an, an ancient university, going through the long span of 700 years of history, there are always going to be uh, philosophical highs and lows. And I believe that this is a moment of philosophical high where the university has said, now listen, we've done the research. Here is the evidence of where we might have not adopted the most ethical practice at the time. On the one hand, we were involved in advocacy to, to end the evil, but at the same time, the evil crept into our institution. But this is a moment now, another high, where you can say, listen, we now have to do the reparatory aspect of it. And the reparatory aspect of it is an expression of an excellent university seeking to be undoubtedly an ethical university and to occupy the high ethical ground. So it is a moment, it is, it is a, a, a spike in that onward march of history. Yes. The contrast I go back to, um, people saying apologies, people saying other kinds of things. What's it? Well, we were quite open, I think, about the way that we had benefited from the slave trade, which was really through bequests. We, we, we didn't uh, own plantations or uh, enslave people ourselves, but we did benefit over quite a lengthy period through the, the 18th and into the 19th century. And our principal, our vice chancellor, was very happy to say sorry. We regret the fact that we uh, accepted those bequests back in the day. But you know, the money's the money's been spent. The scholarships have been 
awarded, um, but you know we can still atone, I think, and, and repair the past through the reparative justice uh, project that we're going to engage in. Give me a sense, look into your crystal ball. Will this create a quiet storm? Will it go away? Will it just be one of those things that the universities have in mind? I don't think it will go away. It, it'll be interesting to see how others pick it up, but for us it will be an enduring relationship that will go on uh, for, for decades to come. It's been a long fight for you, so personal and otherwise. <laughs> your crystal ball. You're a man of history, but you're forward thinking. Where is this going? You know, 10 years ago, I, I made a statement that the reparatory justice movement is going to be the greatest political movement of the 21st century. And at the time, it seemed a bit far-fetched, but crystal ball, as you say, gaze and looking at the problems of modernity, how did the modern Western world emerge? And to a large extent, it had to do with extractions of wealth from people who were militarily defeated, people who were colonized, and the process of extraction for self-empowerment. The, 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 the rhythm of time uh, takes you to a place where, well, that was not fair, that was not right. Look at us now. We are wallowing in the consequences of that. So there has to be justice. So in all of those places that have been ravished by that history of modernity, communities are saying we need justice. So there is a call for justice in Asia, in Africa, in the Americas and the Caribbean. So in all of those three quarters of the world that was colonized, that three quarters of the world is now calling for justice because they too want development. They want development, they want advancement, they want the good life for the citizens. So the global conversation is taking place. And I say, in that three quarters of the world, there's going to be reparatory justice initiatives. So this initiative on our part is a spike again, a moment in what is going to be a global uh, conversation. And importantly, what David had mentioned, you cannot uh, apologize and fossilize. And that's the term I put it. You, you apologize, but you freeze it. You say, well, I apologize, so let's move on. Mm -hmm. If you apologize, then you have to mobilize and galvanize. And this is what we're doing. We're apologizing, but we're galvanizing and mobilizing. But importantly, what this project speaks to is the future development. How can we assist the emergence of the Caribbean peoples? How can we assist with their development on multiple fronts? Uh, Glasgow has an enormous amount of resources because it's an old university. UWI is celebrating its 71st anniversary. Uh, Glasgow is over 700 years. We are 70 years. So the, the, two institutions with such age disparity seeking to partner, the, 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 the young and, and the old coming together is, is really a wonderful, a wonderful synergy. It's only for me to say thank you, gentlemen, for thank advancing you. mankind. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.